This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. This weekend, our show features an interview really with me by our friend, a great friend of the Mises Institute, David Gornoski. You might know his name. He is a Christian libertarian writer whose work is frequently featured at the American Conservative and also at FEE. David takes inspiration from the work of the late Rene Girard, a Stanford professor who was a huge influence on a young Peter Thiel. So David likes the idea of using Girard's work to ground libertarianism in cultural anthropology, in particular, Girard's idea of scapegoat theory. In other words, there's a human tendency to, to want to seek out a scapegoat or scapegoat, so why not let the bad guy in the story be the state? And to this end, David urges us as libertarians to use culture uh, like progressives do, art, music, movies, drama, literature, to tell a better story, and in that story make the state the villain, as opposed to capitalism or rich people or all the things that our friends on the left do so well. So with that, I think you'll enjoy this conversation with David. And on behalf of everyone at the Mises Institute, we, of course, wish you a very Merry Christmas this week. So stay tuned. How long have you been now with the Mises Institute? And, um, you know, assume a lot of our audiences are, are relatively familiar with Mises Institute, but you could just do a little background quickly to summarize uh, what your specific mission is with the group. Well, it's interesting. I guess I've been here three or four years now, and uh, our founder, Lou Rockwell, created the Mises Institute way back in the 80s. And the idea was that the Austrian School of Economics in particular, which is a loose term, I, I don't define it rigidly. There are people who sort of straddle uh, various economic outlooks, uh, that the Austrian School really needed uh, a home base and a, a promotional mechanism, uh, especially for Ludwig von Mises especially for Murray Rothbard, who was still alive at the time. Um, and, and so that, that was our mission to, to help uh, put and keep Austrian economics on the map. And it's, it's kind of strange in a sense because, again, this loose term, what we might today call the Austrian School of Economics, was basically mainstream economics uh, from the late 1800s right up to the 30s, right to the Great Depression. When John Maynard Keynes wrote his famous book, and uh, communism and socialism were on the rise, especially among academics, and things shifted dramatically. But really, up until less than 100 years ago, lots of things that people knew to be true about economics would, would have been considered Austrian viewpoints. Um, today, we're in a very, very different world. We consider the mainstream somewhat Keynesian, even though a lot of a lot of uh, working economists today don't really uh, read Keynes and don't necessarily interpret him accurately. But nonetheless, we find ourselves in an environment today where both government and central banks think that there's this uh, need to create demand, that if we just make humans want to buy enough stuff, that they'll magically also have the means to buy enough stuff. And as a result, we'll all be prosperous. So what most modern economics deals with today is, is at, on some level how to create demand. And we've convinced ourselves, David, that prosperity comes through consumption. And for many, many millennia in human history, people thought that prosperity comes through consuming less than you make and saving the difference and building that up, which we would call capital accumulation, and uh, giving that to your next generation, either individually as a, as a mom or dad, or collectively as a family, or even more broadly as a society. Uh, prosperous societies accumulate capital, poor societies deplete capital and don't accumulate it. Uh, and somehow in the last 100 years, we've gotten very, very far away from this. And, and that, that's one of the reasons uh, the, the Mises Institute exists, to plant the flag and to say, no, uh, Austrians uh, understand money and capital and interest and productivity and human preferences and subjectivity. Uh, and we can explain some of these errors of, of modern economics. And from a civilizational standpoint, I, I don't want to be too grandiose here, but economics is not just some dry study uh, for a few people uh, 
who have PhDs to engage in. It's something for all of us and it affects the arc of civilization. So uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, our, our mission is to provide an alternative and to give the intelligent lay person the, the ability to access economics and understand it because it's, it's not something that ought to be just left to academia. It's interesting you mentioned the comment about um, this Austrian school is about teaching people that it's not all about just consume, consume, and yet, you know, it's a popular conception of capitalism and uh, libertarianism that it's um, totally wedded to the notion of greed and consumerism and materialism, and yet, you know, what you suggested there is that perhaps not. Perhaps that actually would be a much more um, anti consumerist way of doing things if it actually was if you know Austrian economics was actually followed in our in our culture. Well, I wish greed was a concept that people applied to politicians. Nobody ever talks about greedy politicians who want more power and more money, I noticed. But yeah, absolutely the the idea of consuming less than you make is really at the core of of human development, human history. It touches on uh, as we were talking about off mic earlier, anthropology and development and, and culture, there's always been sort of a cultural bequest handed down to the next generation. And that wasn't just information or traditions or attitudes. It was also material. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with materialism. That's why we have roofs over our heads and hot and cold running water at our at our fingertips and electricity at our fingertips and things that previous generations couldn't dream of. And we ought not to be ashamed nor apologize for those things. But we also uh, need to understand that how they came to be was that people engaged in acts of forbearance. Um, they didn't just hedonistically spend every last penny they earned. So uh, it worries me. I have kids and maybe someday I'll have grandkids. It worries me very much that uh, for, really for the first time in human history, and I'm going to have to throw a little shade on baby boomers here. For the first time in human history, we have a, a whole generation that won't focus on leaving something to the next generation. There's lots of people in this country in their uh, 60s and 70s and 80s who have debt, which was unknown uh, 100 years ago. There are people in their, in their 60s, 70s and 80s moving to Florida and getting a 30-year mortgage, David. Imagine that. Um, and I would suggest that in a sense, they're not – they're responding to incentives. The, the Federal Reserve, from my perspective, has made the cost of borrowing money uh, artificially low and that this uh, has an effect that uh, sort of cascades throughout the economy and makes people uh, make bad choices and, and uh, turn savers into chumps because, again, in my view, I think inflation is much higher than reported. Uh, so this is really not just some dry technical issue about central banks and the Fed and and academic economists fighting over some uh, technical changes to what Janet Yellen's proposing or or Ben Bernanke proposed a few years ago. I, I would say that this is actually a civilizational question, and, and and anyone who cares about America and our future in the West ought to be informed about it. So this is ultimately a moral question that you guys are tackling at Mises. Would you say? Well, I suppose it is. Uh, again, that sounds grandiose, but economics is about choice. Choice is about human action. And uh, on some level, I think we all agree that humans ought to deal with, with one another peacefully and voluntarily. And yet, you could certainly make an argument, libertarians make this argument, that what central banks do and what uh, the U.S. Treasury Department does in, in tandem uh, is a form of violence. Uh, that we are forcing people to pay taxes to a system. We are forcing people to use the U.S. dollar as a currency even when uh, we feel it's manipulated by the Fed and that this isn't a peaceful, voluntary way to organize a society – excuse me, to organize an economy because an economy is not just the goods and services that people buy. Econ the other half of the economy is the money that people use to buy those goods and services and that money – is basically being centrally planned by a Politburo of a, of a few dozen people. It says it's every bit as Soviet as when some grain commissar sat around uh, under Khrushchev and said, well, how many bushels of wheat are we going to produce next year? And how many workers are the farms that produce wheat going to hire? And what's the price per bushel going to be? 
you know, a, a typical Wall Street Journal capitalist in, the, in America would say, gee, that's, that's uh, central planning. But when we sit around and do that with money, somehow that, that escapes people's view. We just assume that governments and central banks have to control money. And, and uh, most people in the Austrian school strongly disagree with that and think that the marketplace can produce money just fine. And, and more importantly, that when the marketplace doesn't produce money and government does, that there's a violence to that and an inefficiency to that. So um, – you know, most people who are Austrian or libertarian r really focus and talk about money more than conservatives and liberals do. Yeah, that's interesting. So, how would you define the state, the government itself? What do you have a definition you like to use? I would define the state as an organization that calls itself the state, uh, a group of human beings, by the way, not omniscient experts or technocratic gods, but a, a group of deeply fallible human beings who organize together and say, well, we have a monopoly on who controls this turf. First and foremost, even in the digital age, states are defined by the physical geographical borders over which they claim to assert jurisdiction. So states are defined by two things. One, one the, the, the physical geography over which they exert dominion, and two, the human beings within those physical confines or borders over which they assert jurisdiction. And it's interesting that our conception of the state hasn't changed much in that sense, even in the digital age. It's still, uh, it, it, it still involves borders and humans, which are both uh, flesh and blood and, and tangible and physical. So I don't, I don't view states as uh, magic creations, that somehow the people involved in government are imbued with some kind of metaphysical wisdom when we send them to Washington, D.C. or to our state capitals. Um, but not to sound like a public choice theorist, but uh, I, I view states as just a bunch of people who have a, an undue – uh, monopoly power over violence and force and jails and cops and guns who are every bit as fallible and every and, and who respond to incentives just like people in the private sector respond to incentives. Uh, they want to get reelected and they want to have power and they want to have name ID and they want to have money and they want to have influence and status in society. So I, I view the state as a as a very, very dangerous thing. Where do you think the first state came from? What was the origin of the state in history or what was that first proto-state, so to speak? What do you think that – how did that come about that someone said, yeah, let's go with this? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? And it's a very tough question for libertarians. We shouldn't shy away from it. When we don't have great answers for things, we ought to, we ought to admit it. And let's face it, there's an argument that can be made coherently that says, well, gee whiz, Jeff and David, there's, there's kind of a market for government, isn't there? Because it keeps cropping up in human history and across human societies. Um, I would respond to that by saying, well, look, uh, criminality keeps cropping up uh, across time and across human societies. That, so maybe it's sort of an inherent bug or feature in, in the human psyche, but that doesn't mean we ought not to oppose it. Uh, nobody shrugs their shoulders and says, look, wherever you go throughout history, people murder each other. It, it's just part of who we are as humans. So we ought to just let it go. But there's something special about the state. For example, murder. Yes, we've always had murderers and we've always had thieves. And I know, uh, I think uh, Hoppe has a theory about the history of this, the origins of the state from an Austrian perspective, where he suggests that it's, you know, expropriators joining together as a gang and figuring out how to steal and expropriate other people's property. But there's something sacred about the state, if you think about it, you know, the way people treat it, you know, the flag standing, goosebumps, the, the you know, the language we use, the sacred honor of the sacrifices made for the state in the war, the, the sacred dignity of the presidential office. Uh, everywhere we go, when we look at the state, we have holy days for the state. Um, we have rituals. We have these, these rites of passage that people who want to become leaders of the state have to engage in. Uh, 
Where do you think that came from? Do you have any idea? Well, humans have a desire to be part of something bigger than themselves. We're pack animals. We're, we, we like collective uh, organizations, at least when they're voluntary. We, we like being part of a religion, some people. We like being part of, uh, you know, a, a particular sports team's fan base. Uh, you know, we like being part of a family. There's all kinds of mini nations within human societies. So I, I, I suppose it is hardwired to an extent. But what, what changes with the state is, as you mentioned, there's this religiosity to it. And there's also this respect. The, the state isn't just the biggest, baddest, most successful gang. Nobody thanks the Crips or the Bloods when they pay them their 10 percent uh, in return for allowing them to operate a crack corner somewhere. Um, they they mutter under their breath and they pay the 10 percent or I don't know what the Crips and Bloods are charging these days, but they pay the money because something very bad will happen to them if they don't. But it's so fascinating how governments have made this leap in, in people's minds where they actually sort of say thank you. Thank you for providing roads. Thank you for, for providing military protection. Thank you for providing uh, police protection. Thank you for providing courts and dispute resolution when, when you and I might know or at least argue that these are all illusions. The state doesn't provide any of these things. Um, so it's – look, it, it's a thorny question and, and maybe, you know, maybe Doug Casey, the great investment advisor and guru, has the best answer. He says, you know, maybe this is just – maybe liberty libertarianism – is a, a DNA thing. Uh, maybe 10% of people are, are wired with this uh, gene to, uh, to question all of this and maybe 90% aren't. In other words, he's arguing for the nature over nurture uh, uh, case. So I, I don't know. I, I think this is getting above my pay grade, but um, it's part of human nature. And sometimes we have to appeal to our better a angels and and fight certain tendencies in human nature, just like we have to fight our, our ability maybe to, to get out of our car really angry when someone cuts us off and take a baseball bat to their window. You know, maybe on a bigger scale, we have to fight this impulse to form states. Yeah, I, I think if you look at the, you know, more ancient forms of states, they didn't call them states, I guess, but, you know, look at the Aztecs or the Incas or... Um, you know, even Greeks and so forth, the marriage of, of culture and state and religion was pretty much one. There was there were like synonyms and there was no sense of distinction between the sacred and the, the role of politics. The king, you know, later on, it became the divine right of kings as we became to modernize a little bit. But it was still a totally church function. Sure, so I sure. would say that the state is just a vestige of sacrificial religion. That's all it is. It's just a it's just a holdover from the way ancient societies and even before that archaic communities made their their ritual, you know, kind of remembrance of who they were and who who they are as a people. And so maybe it's just a bad habit uh, that was picked up along the way and something we need to grow out of from, you know, maybe we as a species need to evolve out of this um, kind of antiquated framework of having community. Well, that would explain the religiosity that surrounds the state. We all see this in progressives and conservatives today. They, they uh, view the state with religious fervor and they react to criticisms of the state with religious hostility. So I, I, I think there's, there's a lot of parallels. And I think for in secular cultures in the West, the, the state has replaced religion. And, and, and as you mentioned, uh, state and religion were one and the same. Even in recent history, you know, you just go back a few hundred years for civil state functions like property records. The Church of England, for example, <laughs> held those records, marriage and birth certificates, death records. Um, you know, maybe it's just part of a long, tortured process of of human evolution. So we'll we'll see what comes. But but here and now, in our lifetimes, uh, I think we have to deal with these stubborn creatures known as humans the way they are. And uh, the way they are is they do a lot better when they're less governed. So at least less governed externally. So uh, th that that's our challenge. Right. And. Uh I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I just think that the way we deal with moving people away from the state has more to do with aesthetic uh, 
and art and symbolism and those deeper gut things than it does with, you know, changing people's minds. Ultimately, we can. You're right. Maybe there is 10 percent of the population that is hardwired to to receive deep, rational, beautiful um, principle and to master economics and so forth. But for the vast majority of the population, I wonder if we're never going to get anywhere with them, if we always appeal to reason and facts about, hey, you know, the facts are this about the state. It's more that we have to tell a story that makes the state ugly and shows the state for what it really is, that the emperor has no clothes, so to speak. Um, you know, for example, why why do we send people into cages, human cages, where they have a high likelihood of receiving violence or even sexual assault, you know, for doing a nonviolent thing like getting high or not paying a minimum wage. You know, that comes with actually you go to prison if you don't pay the minimum wage. They fine you first, and if you keep going, you know, they'll, they'll put you in jail. So you can go to jail for not paying your wages properly that the collective deems appropriate. You go to jail for, uh, you know, having a broken taillight. That's what killed that one guy. The the cop came to him and, you know, put drew, drew a gun because he had a broken taillight and he ended up dead. You know, so we kill people. We, we put them in cages. And if you just think about that, how barbaric, it sounds like something from uh, thousands of years ago, doesn't it? The idea that you put someone in a rape cage because they got high. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it is crazy. And, and we're not very good storytellers. I, I think you're right. And we need more people who are. I freely admit this. You know who told a story was Donald Trump. Donald Trump told a story and it went off on a lot of tangents and it wasn't necessarily that easy to follow and it seems crazy in some ways, but he, he told a story that was better than Hillary's story and he was a better storyteller than Hillary was, a more confident storyteller. So um, the idea that Libertarians need to tell stories is very, very interesting. And of course, Ayn Rand, Atlas Shrugged, and The Fountainhead are two examples of stories that gripped a lot more people and won a lot more people over uh, than, you know, here we are on, on the other side, the non-storytelling side, the fact side, the, the reason side. I, I mean, here we are. We're still having to explain how minimum wage hurts the poorest people the most and, and creates unemployment among low-skilled people. We're still having to explain rent control. We're still having to explain the same old tired, tired, tired arguments that have been absolutely eviscerated a hundred times over by far better people like, like Hayek and Mises and Milton Friedman. And, um, it just goes to show you that what you're saying is so important. We have a hindbrain that oftentimes is a lot more uh, powerful in terms of our motivations than our fully conscious, rational brain. I, I think if we're going to really take a stab at the heart of the state, we got to really look at what makes uh, the state so attractive at such a guttural level and, and take that apart and really tell a better story. And, if, and it's really easy to do, really. All we have to do is tell the victim's story. If we tell the victims of the state's story, it loses its mystification. It loses its, 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 uh, its mysterious power, its aura. Look at, look at for example, Erwin uh, Schiff, you know, Peter Schiff's father. Erwin Schiff was a tax protester. Now, I personally disagree with the, you know, the ideas, the, the, the method he was trying to use to get people to know, hey, don't you have to pay income tax. I think you should pay the income tax for the same reason that Jesus says when they come for your uh, cloak, give them your tunic, too. Just don't let the mafia beat you up any more than they have to, you know. So I believe that. But yeah, Erwin Schiff had a different opinion, you know, and what they ended up doing is they they caged this elderly man. And he died of cancer, chained to a hospital bed away from his family. You have to think to yourself, what is the great taboo? This human being, you know, made in the image of God, what in the hell do you have to be to cage an elderly man dying of cancer, not allowing him to get fresh air, not allowing him to see his family? Because the greed of what? He was promoting people. If you wanted to be like the state's best argument, he was greedy. And God forbid if we let everybody 
get an a idea about what he's saying. Everybody will be greedy and we can't build roads or whatever crap they can come up with. And, and so what I want to get people to see is if I was talking to an ordinary person, I'd say, would you cage an elderly man and keep him from seeing his grandchildren as he's dying because you want you think that's the only way you can have your trash picked up? You don't think you can figure out a way to pick up trash other than a state mechanism like putting people in cages if they don't pay? Like you, you don't think there's a way to solve building roads other than to sacrifice an elderly man like Irwin Schiff to let him die in such a, it was such a pathetic, horrible situation? You see, once we tell the story of the victims, the, most, the emotional power that we connect with them, if you tell that story long enough, of people like Irwin, and there's thousands and millions more drug users, whatever, tell their stories, tell what it was like in the hidden confines of the state. They can't survive that. That's what I'm going to get at. If we tell the victim story, if we take the camera away, the camera is run right now by the population and their ignorance. We take that camera and, you know, there's, let's say this is an ongoing movie of history. And we take that camera, we put it in the hands of the victims that the state chews up quietly, and we don't see the story. And if we tell that story, and I'm talking literally, tell it in a documentary, tell it in a short film, tell it in an article, and just push it, push it, push it, push it every day, just like this Me Too thing, you know? If we're really going to deal, for example, just as a little tangent to the same point I'm making, if we're really going to deal honestly with sexual assault, then the state won't exist because the state's very existence is predicated on the threat of sexual assault. I mean, if everybody knew that if you didn't have to pay taxes, you'd go to a Hotel Hilton where you're, where you're taking care of breakfast, lunch, and dinner with really peaceful, nice people, I don't think anybody would pay taxes. It's the threat of physical violence that makes people obey and pay some ridiculous tax so the CIA can protect poppy fields in Afghanistan. You know, so why do we, you know, the only way, the only way we do this stuff is that we have these dirty little secrets about what makes the state function. And if we just stop making them secrets and start telling them from a human interest perspective, I think that storytelling power has a way to delegitimize the state's evil in such a powerful and profound way that we'd be amazed that we're not doing it already every day. It, it, isn't it interesting? Erwin Schiff shares a lot in common with a younger guy, Ross Albrecht, who's currently in prison for his involvement with the uh, with the Silk Road uh, dark website. What's so interesting is that both Ross Albrecht and Erwin Schiff not, not only do they engage in these opting out activities, but they, they they made the fatal mistake from the state's perspective of talking about it. In other words, Erwin Schiff published books and Ross Ulbricht spoke or, or, or wrote too freely on emails, uh, some of which ended up in the hands of the FBI. And of course, the whole uh, notion, the whole charge, potential charge that Ross Ulbricht had uh, solicited murder for hire was, was completely false. And it was just used as a tactic uh, in his negotiations with the, the federal government, and, and that charge was never actually levied uh, nor brought, uh, and he certainly wasn't convicted on it. Um, so, uh, you know, both of these men languished or now languish in jail, I exactly as you suggest. And and the question becomes, how do you tell stories in the face of a bigger, more powerful apparatus? Uh, of the state and its own storytellings, because as you, you know, you said, we'll put it in a documentary. Well, if we made a documentary about Ross Ulbricht, uh, imagine the pushback. There'd be people saying, oh, well, uh, th that's great, David, but you know, that site was used to buy drugs or that site was used to uh, launder money or, you know, it could have been used for human trafficking. Uh, you know, what about the children? So we don't get to tell our stories in a vacuum or without pushback. There's, there's a lot of people on every side these days. But here, here's the good news. The good news is that the ability to tell the story is so much cheaper and easier than it was 30 years ago. And all we had, we had to sit there and listen to Walter Cronkite on the evening news for, tw yeah. for 20 minutes, just lay, lay down how things are. And there was no pushback. Today, 
uh, it, it's unbelievable how cheap it has become to produce podcasts, to produce books, to produce videos, to produce f- feature-length films. It, it's it's been a great equalizer, and um, maybe we need to. Uh, 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 well, I, I like the idea of our own campaign, a Me Too campaign, something that powerful. But maybe we need to have a movement or workshops under the auspices of organizations like the Mises Institute uh, that promote libertarian filmmakers. Um, and, and, you know, because some of the old libertarian movies are kind of schlocky and they need to be better. So uh, that that's that's a really fascinating thing. And I love the idea of documentaries. Yeah, I think it's all about telling the story. If you show the story and see, that's the thing. Libertarians get too left brain. They're talking about the facts, right? Just tell the story. Put a camera. You know, what I've been doing is I've been going around and finding people who've been imprisoned, right? And I filmed them sharing what happened to them in prison. You know, just tell just tell me what happened. Tell me what the smells were like. Tell me what the sights were like. Tell me what happened in your first time in prison. And it's fascinating, this, the human interest stories that are told. And when you tell that and you just show, you know, show the victim's family, show the, the person who's thrown away in a cage for getting high, show the children that are, are crying when they see their, that their parent is gone. And just show that story and then keep teaching the principle all along. No violence for nonviolence. Well, there's no question that that the U.S. prison system is probably (laughs) – well, maybe apart from public schools, uh, the the most shameful thing about America today. And and, uh, I would love to see prison crime statistics. We almost think prisons are outside of of, uh, our crime stats because these people are sort of off the record. But I would love to see criminality – that occurs in prison. I'd love to see those stats glommed onto whatever state or community, so that the the governor had to uh, uh, own up to the true stats of r- rape, uh, assault, murder, uh, illicit drug use, etc. In his or her state, let's say as a as a governor, because I I suspect uh, very strongly that we don't include what happens in prison in our crime stats and. Uh, yeah, it's it's just one of those things. We tend to think about and care about what's closest to us and what's right in front of us, and that can be on social media or or whatever it is. And and when you take people out of the game and put them in jail, we we you warehouse them, stack them on top of each other, we we forget about them. So uh, it's it's that's the very lifeblood of the state. The state yeah. depends on that right to do that. You know, they they are the only institution that can ritually sacrifice nonviolent, peaceful people. Bar none. Nobody else can. You know, now Marxists will try to tell people that the market is a sacrificial machine because, you know, if you want a Lamborghini and you're poor, you don't get to have one. Therefore, you're a sacrifice. <laughs> That's what they tell, stupid stuff like that. But the real violence, actual physical violence against nonviolent, peaceful people is the prerogative only of the state. The state is the only one allowed to do that. And all we have to do is just challenge that assumption by telling stories to undermine their ability to obfuscate our violence against people. Because if you ask someone, like if you take anybody who's like an average status affirming normal person, you're on a jury panel and you say, you know, do you really want to, you know, this person got high, okay? Or this person was driving with a suspended license. Do you really want to walk that person to the cell? You know, do you want to put the cuffs on them yourself? Do you want to be the guy that says, no, you can't hug your child tonight. You're going to be stuck in this cage. Do you want to be the person that guards them and they go to the common areas where there's violent gangs and they have to decide, oh, crap, I'm not used to this. I don't know which gang to join. And uh, I guess I got to threaten violence or else I'm going to be a physically assaulted. You know, I've asked people. I've asked John Beza. He was a former corrections officer. I asked him, you know, I was like, what's the percentage chance that you're going to have to engage in violence? He said, it's pretty close to 100 percent, you know, if you want to survive in prison, even if you were in there for a nonviolent victimless crime. So I said, it's basically 100 percent chance you're going to have to engage in some kind of violence or else violence is going to visit upon you. I mean, look how barbaric that system is. Even if you, for example, were to say, well, it's not guaranteed that someone's going to be sexually assaulted. Well, even if it's a 20 percent increase in the probability that someone will be assaulted sexually, if they're in a prison cage versus not in a prison cage, you're still immorally, you know, you're, it's still an immoral act for you to have done that. You know, that, that's so insane, the idea that we can exonerate our moral responsibility if we sat on a jury panel that sent someone into a cage where they can't leave with violent sociopaths. That's what a sick, barbaric concept that is, right? You know, 
It's like all you have to do is just to think about it and just talk about it. And it's so dumb and evil that it kind of kills itself just by being talked about, honestly, you know? Well, juries ought to be told about that. They ought to be told about the extra sentencing realities of prison life. But uh, it, yeah, it, it is pretty amazing when we think about it that apparently more men than women in the U.S. are raped when we include prison statistics for one. Uh, but you know, getting back to your point about storytelling and explaining to people uh, uh, violence, it's interesting. A, a lot of people in this country really don't see the state – as a form of violence. I mean, they would push back uh, on what you just said. They would say, look, you know, we have laws and you, some guy chooses not to pay his taxes or not to comply with some law or regulation. And the, the police issue a warrant for his arrest. And he doesn't come in and, and submit to that arrest. And so the cops go look him up at his house and he won't come to the door. And so you and I would say, well, you know, he hasn't done anything violent, but yet they're going to bang his door down and they're going to physically grab him and handcuff him and haul him off to a very dangerous place. It, it's, it's interesting how a lot of people don't see that as unjustified violence. I mean, they understand that there's a, that there's a physically violent element to what the cop does. They, they get that, but they, they don't see that more broadly as the state is inherently violent. And they think that the cop is entirely justified in his actions. There's no question that I, I would argue the majority of Americans view things that way. So that's, that's a very tough hurdle. It, it, when we start talking about the state as violence, it, as much as that appeals to me a, as a rhetorical device a, a, and also as an objective reality, I, I also have to be honest and say that really rings false with a lot of people, including our progressive friends. They don't like the way that sounds. They don't want to engage that line of argument. They want to dismiss it. And, and they, they want to dismiss the people who use it as cranks or you know, people who just use hyperbole that, you know, gee whiz, if a cop pulls you over and you don't comply, yeah, he's going to have to drag you out of your car. And this is just, this is just part of the game. But that doesn't mean government is violent. I mean, what would be your response to that? Well, there's a couple of things there. One, I would say if you talk to the average person who's mildly politically involved or what have you, every one of people, you can find someone with a few scapegoats that they'll that they'll admit the state wrongfully scapegoats people about. So if you go to a progressive, you'll get them with the drug war, right? They'll go with you on that real big. A lot of progressives that you'll talk to, they'll say, yeah, it's violent for a state to come and arrest um, poor people for doing drugs. They'll tell you that. At least they'll give you lip service. It's not the top thing on their agenda, but they'll tell you that. Right. So you start where you, you can find an entry point with everyone. So with uh, your average conservative, they'll tell you it's violence for the state to force you at the barrel of a gun to buy health care. They'll say, yeah, that's Obama. That's unjust, immoral, uh, violent law. You know, if you say, yeah, that's violent, they'll say, yeah, that is. Uh, or, you know, certain certain conservatives will go with you on other economic regulations. Yeah, it's violence. It's coercion to force someone to use uh, minimum wage, you know, whatever the minimum wage is. So you can get each uh, faction will agree with you that the state uses violence against scapegoats. They only have their own pet scapegoats. So the one thing we have to do is tell stories in a way that unites the principle across the board. That's all we got to do. So you take their entry point scapegoat. For the left, it may be um, sex workers. It may be prostitutes. It, I mean, uh, it may be uh, drug users, drug dealers. Um, for the right, it may be economic uh, regulation violators, people who, you know, I, I know that a lot of conservatives don't like the fact that the EPA throws people in jail for messing with their water, you know, the river area access or something or changing their backyard. So the nanny state people, there's a lot of conservatives, mainstream conservatives that hate the nanny state and they see it as violent and wicked government. But you just got to unite the principle. You got to say no violence for nonviolence. If there's no victim, there's no crime. Victimless crime, there is no crime. Just keep repeating that mantra either – either rhetorically or symbolically in the imagery that you show and just keep tying it to the unifying principle. If you make a law, progressive, if you make a law to criminalize heroin, you have given, you have seeded the principle for criminalizing every other nonviolent behavior. Once you say that a state has the power to draw guns on someone who's done nothing, he's not hurt anybody, 
He's not stolen from anybody. He's not assaulted anybody. Once you say the, the state has the right to draw deadly force on anybody for a singular issue, you cede that moral principle to the state and they can expand it to every area you hate. So conservatives, you know, you tell that the conservatives say, hey, look, you know, I know you don't like drugs, but here's the deal. You know, you, you know how you're worried about the state having the, the privilege to, you know, you, put you in jail if you don't bake a cake for someone you don't agree with. Well, guess what? That principle exists because you, you let it exist for things like drugs. Once the state has the power to criminalize any nonviolent behavior, you've given them a moral paradigm that they can just push and pull and adjust accordingly as popular opinion sways in the wind, you see? And so that's the thing that we have to unite left and right on and say, hey, we each have our own scapegoats that we think, yeah, give it to them, put them in a cage. But if we really think about it, we wouldn't do it ourselves. You know, if you ask a leftist who loves big government, would you put cage, would you put cuffs on Erwin Schiff yourself? Well, no, that's, I wouldn't do that. Well, you know, mm. would you put him in, in the back of a car and kidnap him yourself? No, I guess I wouldn't do that. You just walk him through. When you walk them through, it, you see the humanness opens up, right? And so it, it's it's all about telling the stories of specific cases and just walking people through. Well, I think that's, that's a great application to domestic policy of what uh, we try to apply to foreign policy. I know sometimes even at libertarian gatherings, I will be challenged on the, the principle of non-interventionism. And people say, well, Jeff, what would it take for you – to authorize U.S. troops to invade, you know, how bad would a dictator have to be? You would have, you wouldn't have uh, gone into World War II, you know, that sort of argument. And uh, having just finished Michael Malice's book on North Korea, you know, there is an example of a society so horrific that you can imagine even the most uh, uh, pacifist libertarian saying, oh my gosh, maybe we ought to do something about that. But I always offer a very simple test, and it's similar to what you're saying, would you put the handcuffs on on Erwin Schiff? And most people say no. Um, but this relates to foreign policy. I say, you know, I cannot in good conscience ask the government using a proxy of a, you know, some probably less affluent kid who signed up for the, the Marine Corps or the Army. I cannot ask government to use that kid as a proxy for something I wouldn't do myself or I wouldn't send my own kid to do. So if you ask me right here, right now today, Jeff, will you give up your job, uh, potentially no job to return to? Will you leave your marriage and your house and your mortgage payments uh, for an unknown term of years? for much lower military pay, leave my wife and kids to go don a uniform and fight to overthrow the regime, physically fight to overthrow the regime in North Korea. As as bad as it is, uh, my answer is no, I wouldn't. And, and nor would I send my son, who's not old enough, but if he was. Uh, so in, in less than until the answer is yes, I don't think I have the right to send anybody else. Now, uh, I happen to live in Auburn, Alabama. If a, uh, a foreign power sent a bunch of ships into the Gulf 120 miles away from me and they started lobbing cruise missiles into Mobile or Pensacola or something, well, yeah, I'd probably go down there and, and help try to f to fight off those ships. That, that would be a, a conflict that I would fight in without any need for the government to have a draft or anything else. I would fight in it out of self-protection and self-interest. So um, – I, I like the application of that idea to domestic policy. Would would I personally go do something? And for a lot of people, the answer is probably going to be no. Right. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't be the guy that keeps the, the, the cell locked as someone beats a man up for being greedy, right? I mean, if you're in jail for a victimless crime, you're being put in a cage where you cannot escape. There's no way you can get out if someone says, hey, we're a gang. We don't like the way you looked at us. We're going to beat you. To, 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 we're going to beat the hell out of you. Or we're going to do whatever else we want to do to you. We're going to we're going to make you so stripped of your humanity, you won't know what how to think straight for for the rest of your life. And we do that with such a flippant carelessness that the only way we're able to do that is because someone just doesn't tell the story. I I, I know that sounds weird. You're like, whoa. I mean, people are thinking, and I think, well, is it that simple? Yeah, it really is. It's, I'm not saying you make a movie and then you're done. I'm saying you keep telling. You make it a contagion where other people are using art. They're interviewing a guy with a webcam. You know, they're interviewing with a, you know, they go down. There's people all around our cities who are thrown away by society because of victimless crime laws and just tell their stories. 
and then link it back to the principle. No victim, no crime. No violence for a nonviolence. No violence. Just keep re reiterating that mantra. That's the only way the mainstream will get onto stuff. That's how they get into that cone. That, remember that whole thing? They got into the Coney 2012 and everybody mm -hmm. got into that. So you just what we have to do, I am convinced 100 percent is we have to move libertarianism away from the book club set, which is they'll all we keep them there. They're there. Keep keep developing that. But if we really want to make a crack at the mainstream, we have to we have to go into the heart strings. We have to tell the emotions and we have to um, we have to tell a better story. And um, and that's the way that it'll become it. We have to basically make libertarianism a humanitarian crisis, not like, oh, well, there's Marxism and there's libertarianism and there's conservatism mm -hmm. and uh, just pick which tribe. No, 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 no. F screw that. We don't have time for that. <laughs> there's people right now that don't have the luxury of being able to flee an attacker. We can. If someone comes to our house. You know, you can get a weapon, you can leave, you can run, you can do stuff. But if you're in a prison cell, you can't. You're confined to be inflicted upon with violence. You don't have any way to defend yourself or anything. And we're okay with that as a society as long as we're not making – we should be screaming about this every day, that this is a humanitarian crisis and that it's, it, it rests at the very heart of the state's existence. See, what I have found – the culture, see, we, we really are in a great place if we just reach out and grab it, see, in terms of our cultural power. Watch, you know, think about it. Right now, it's extremely popular to talk about criminal justice reform. It's bipartisan. It's like one of the few feel-good bipartisan things that left and right says, yeah, I like Rand Paul and all that because he does that. You'll see, you know, you'll, you'll hear liberals talk about that. And so what you do is you take that starting point. It's already become a humanitarian crisis issue. It's already got leftist churches and Christian progressive groups and conservative groups like uh, Chuck Colson's group, uh, Justice Fellowship and Prison Fellowship. They do a lot of stuff with this, and they're very arch, you know, conservative, evangelical mm -hmm. friendly. So you take that, and then you take the left groups because they won't listen to us about anything else. But you take the criminal justice thing, and you use it as a bulwark to say, hey. If we're really honest about this, we don't need to just trim around the hedges. We need to make a new reform that there, if there is no victim, there is no crime. And just and just let that principle through storytelling. You tell the stories of the raw milk farmer, the alternative medicine seller. There's real stories of people in cages for this. Tell their story. Show their children crying on camera. Show, I mean, not in an exploitive way. Show the natural emotion. Show what it's really happening. Just tell their story. Let their tears speak for themselves. Let the pain and, and the in immorality of the whole thing just unveil itself. And if we do that, you create a snowballing trend where now it's unfortunately the hate uses word, but it's now trendy for people to talk about me too when it comes to the very existence of victimless crime laws. And now we can talk about, man, we should never put uh, human beings in a cage. Why are we putting you know, poor black people and brown people and white people and every people, women? Because it's not just men being assaulted in prison. It's women, too. They're being assaulted. Why are we doing this? And you make it you make it a humanitarian crisis. That's where I think libertarianism needs to go. I think in some ways, this is kind of paradoxical. We need to die in order to become alive, right? And what I mean by that is we need to die as this, like I said, a camp that you choose from, and we need to become more transcendent where it's like, no, what liberty is about is a, is a humanitarian crisis in our own backyard where people are being assaulted and the children, the moms, I mean, kids are begging for their parents to come home at night and they're not coming home. And they're being left fatherless and mother this on the streets and the cycle of evil continues and it's all because of us because we refuse to withdraw our consent from victimless crime laws and guess what victimless crime laws includes ultimately laws for taxation as well so the very heart of the state is gutted if we take criminal justice reform the cultural appetite for it and we just keep using it as a wedge to open the whole pandora's box yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, it's tough. It's tough sledding because we are so tribal. You, you mentioned Rand Paul. Even people who really like what Rand Paul has to say on a couple of things 
um, you know, you start talking to them deeper and they'll oftentimes say, oh, he's crazy though, or he's a libertarian or, or he's this and that, because we have this, not only do we have tribalism, but we have two big tribes. And, and uh, as opposed to what I would much prefer, uh, 50 or 100 or 300 tribes in America uh, you know, coexisting peacefully as opposed to Democrat and Republican. So it's, it's a challenge, but uh, you know, something has to be done differently than we've been doing it for the last 30 years because I think while libertarianism is growing and the libertarian mindset is – there's no question it's growing. There's no question there's a lot of success stories at the individual level. You see people's lives being changed. But uh, the population is growing too. That's the question. Are we any bigger than we were 30 years ago at, at per capita? And so I, I hope the answer is yes, but it's not so clear. Right. And, and, yet, and yet still people um... – 70% of the country still says they're Christian, you know, so we have this unifying tribe, so to speak, that supersedes uh, some of the other things and say, you know, I am a Christian and Jesus says, do not resist evil with violence and turn the other cheek. So I guess I have to think about, does that include turning the other cheek when it comes to dealing with a drug user? Does do not resist evil with violence as Jesus commands his followers? Does that include uh, people who sell raw milk, and I'm afraid of raw. I'm afraid raw milk is going to poison people. Do I resist that with violence if the state says I can? Well, maybe not. Maybe if we actually teach people that in juries you can vote not guilty because you find the law to be immoral. Maybe that's another area where we can infect the culture by saying, "Hey, when you go into your jury duty, you know, hashtag me too. Say not guilty, not guilty if it's a victimless crime." Let your friends, let your neighbors go if they haven't had a victim, you know. So there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting angles that we can explore, and um, I think the Christian identity is something that you don't even have to be a Christian to understand. If if you know seventy percent of your neighbors believe in this thing, make make them accountable to it. You know what I mean? It's like if you really believe in Jesus, here, man, this is the way you would you would live that out, right? It says right here, do not resist evil with violence. Where's the asterisk? <laughs> you know? Where does it say, unless you're on a jury panel, you can then throw away a guy for selling milk from a cow's udder and throw him into a cage? It's like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and, and the only way people are going to understand that is if you just show that's actually what's happening. You, know, you just got to tell them. Well, all I can say in, in response to that is if you're going to a church that has a bunch of American flags up behind the pulpit and the uh, minister or pastor or priest is giving homilies to the state, you know, you need, you need to speak up. That's something you can do right here, right now, locally. Um, you know, are you a Christian or are you a, a, a subject of U.S. FEDGA? Very, very important question. Well, very good. And I just I wanted to tell you, thanks for coming on. Uh, I've really enjoyed our discussion and throwing back back and forth ideas. It's been fun. Thank you, David. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher and SoundCloud or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.